Good morning, everybody, and welcome to TLC Life. I'm back to the studio. Thank you, Bobby, for always being here. Sure thing. And be the trooper. And Orlando Sanchez from Montana. Good morning, Orlando. Good morning, guys. Good to see you, Bobby. And yeah, welcome good. back. Yeah, good to see you, Orlando. Are you freezing there? You still got sub zeros? You know, it's actually a beautiful day here. Uh, it's uh, just a little bit above freezing, but the sunshine is spectacular. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, um, uh, we're glad that you're having a good weather. Here it is also weird in the 80s. It's like back to <laughs> back to summer. <laughs> right. it's, it's muggy. It's, yeah, we're, yeah, it's in December and it's, it's mm. horrible. Uh, feeling uh, it's again humid and hot, but anyway, that's Houston. So we are uh, we have a full show uh, mm -hmm. with uh, good things and no not not as good things. We're very disappointed of uh, yesterday runoff elections in League City. Um, our first guest is Larissa Ramirez, and we were cheering for you, Larissa. And but we are even though that the results are not what we wanted or we expected regardless. And I was texting with Larissa this morning and I was telling you, regardless, you are a winner for us yep. because you started uh, from nothing and you built in a, in a, in a no time, a campaign and a website commercials. And you came this far to the runoff. So I think this is uh, for us in TLC that we're being supporting you from day one. It's a, it's a win situation because this is a good base for you. And we want to hear from you what happened yesterday, what happened during the campaign days, the results, and what is coming for you. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, it was, a, um, <clears throat> it was an interesting race for sure. During the during you know the entire election um you know we were we were all out there it was you know everybody was pumped up and, and voting for different people whether it was on the local status you know the state level and then we hit a runoff right after thanksgiving <laughs> and so um with the holidays and such that was a little challenging we did have um people that you know had mail-in ballots because they were you know they planned ahead of time they were going to be out of town um it, it wasn't the results that that we were expecting you know and then again to get people back out there during the holiday times is is challenging especially um especially if you know you have uh, younger folks that have children and, and that are going on vacation and things of that sort. But all in all, I would say that this has been quite an experience and this is just the beginning. And in, in my in my opinion, we we can't stop here. Um, this is just the beginning. This is this is what you know, we know what the demographic is. We know what everybody is expecting and what people want, what the community wants. And we have to continue to push forward to keep our to keep everybody involved to keep this generation involved so larissa uh give us an analysis of uh, because in the general election you did quite well i think you were the top vote getter you went into a runoff you had the endorsement of uh, of uh, some previous opponents the city mayor uh former members of congress uh, former state mm -hmm. representatives uh, former uh, land commissioner mm -hmm. uh, what happened? Is, is Was Galveston County more challenging? Was it a lack of uh, getting your message across at the end of the day? How do you how do you assess, you know, the day after? In my opinion, the day after um, I, you know, I I although you I think, you know, we came in strong with a lot of support from several different um, state and local endorsements saying, yes, you know, let's let, you know, we support Larissa, we endorse Larissa because, you know, <clears throat> we've worked with them in the past and because of conversations we've had. But I think, you know, one of the things that they told me was they've never seen a city council run quite like this before, um, where there were so many endorsements. And I think it kind of got people a little worried and a little a little worked up and and when i say people i mean you know the county i think the county got got a little worked up and said well who is this person who is coming in so strong right off the bat and honestly i think that in the beginning they underestimated the uh the minority vote 
I think in the beginning that was that was underestimated as well. And so when you get the second chance to do it, you know, um, they, they were calling in all resources and everybody they could to overcome the, mi the minority vote and to overcome so that it doesn't happen again like it did in the beginning. Mm -hmm. wow, well, as good. Andrea said, you know, hats off to you for making the sacrifice. We know that you're a working mom uh, and, uh, you know, it wasn't easy. Uh, we're disappointed, of course, but we are glad that you, uh, you know, threw your hat into the ring, as they say, and uh, put together a, a good campaign and we hope that you stay involved absolutely we cannot this is like i said this is just the beginning um there is absolutely no way that we can back down especially now during this movement and being able to get the word out for all young uh, conservatives in general whether you're latino whether you're not latino but just letting the word go out and that's and that's my my mission and that's going to be the goal for 2023 so as, as, as we speak, Larissa, do you have any plans in mind right now or you're just thinking uh, uh, what I'm going to do after this with this experience, what I learned from this experience, um, what I'm taking, the good, the bad, just to make it or put a better campaign and, for, and if you're thinking to running for something else? Mm -hmm. Adelante. We, I have to keep going forward, you know, um, so whether the opportunity presents itself in at, at, a, at a local level um, or any level, you know, we it's our responsibility, you know, as and I believe as a parent, as a mother, it's my responsibility to to take action and to take that step forward. And so, you know, if there are any opportunities that I see that arise, then you better believe I'm going to be there. <laughs> hey, Larissa, I had a question really quickly about your, your experience. You know, you talk about conservatives being involved and getting involved and you staying involved, but not all of those activists do that as a, a candidate. Uh, there's, there's lots of ways to do that. So what was your experience, you know, something that surprised you as being a candidate uh, out there that you may have not expected uh, for those people that are interested in, in pursuing that route? You know, there's consultants, there's fundraisers, but there's the candidates too. So, so what kind of, what'd you learn from, from this experience? I learned that <clears throat> you have to keep your eye on on the goal, on the ball. I learned that there's going to be a lot of outside influence. And then once you are there, you know, everybody wants to, wants to fill your head with the negative and positive and, and it, it could be your closest friend, your closest family member that says, well, why are you doing that? There's absolutely no way that you can do that. So you have to stay determined and you have to stay determined despite all odds. Um, and, and a lot of people get discouraged because of that, or they'll get discouraged and say, well, you know, I don't want to get involved in, in politics whatsoever, whether it's a candidate or, or even joining my local, my local Republican club because of, um, because of acceptance, you know, because of, uh, because of, you know, just the way people just are. To heck with those people. You keep going. You know, you have to because if, if we don't, then 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 who knows the next generation to come? Oh, that's, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. That's let's uh, switch gears just a little bit because you you League City is in the news mm -hmm. uh, for this runoff election, but also for this latest city council vote regarding the libraries. What's what's your opinion on that? If you can bring um, our listeners, our viewers, up to date. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad you brought it up. I was there last night at the city council okay. meeting, um, knowing that they were going to address this particular topic as it relates uh, to the censorship of uh, books in the public library. So this, it, before, you know, once the agenda kind of released, it caused an uproar on social media. You had people that were from all walks of life, you know, from left to right to middle, wherever your stance was politically at this point it didn't matter because everybody and what was the exact issue that they were picking that they were uh, yeah let's addressing? explain to our viewers oh. what happened uh, last night uh, to me it was a uh, it was a win situation for the kids for the parents and for our community and for the society so let's uh, let's explain to the viewers what happened last night at city council in league city so it was a long it was a long meeting but last night basically on the agenda item they proposed 
that there would be some type of censorship in the children's section of the public library on books that are related to um, certain topics. And, and I can't remember the full list, but the topics such as um, pedophilia, such mm -hmm. as topics that are deemed um, um, sexual ideology, um, things, of, things of that sort. Now, what the question was, um, was some people were stating that that particular agenda item was um, too vague uh, because a lot of other books like To Kill a Mockingbird or books that we read, you know, growing up in school may have been um, in that particular uh, in that particular title. Um, whereas others completely disagreed and they took examples of such children's books to uh, to, to the front to read excerpts from those books. Um, so basically what they wanted to do was they, uh, some people thought it was a, a book burn kind of deal, you know, burning books, banning books. But um, what they wanted to do was have some type of censorship to where you had your library board and you have your city council, but they wanted to make an additional committee that was compiled of the seven members of the library board and eight members that were appointed by city council to bring um, questionable books to and either approve them or deny them. Okay, yeah, it's very interesting. According to the news report, um, the resolution that was passed was dealing with the use of taxpayer funds for purchasing, displaying, or stocking books. And Larissa, you mentioned some of the categories, pedophilia or incest, rape or bondage, uh, books that dis depict sexual or nudity for audiences uh, ten, intended for audiences 10 or younger. And I think that's the, the main key that's here. Great. It's not looking like to, to ban books. It's saying that if your target audience is 10 years old or, or younger, you shouldn't be addressing these, these kind of topics. And to me, Lake City last night set an example for other cities, mm -hmm. for the whole state and probably the, 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 the country right. to follow this. This is, a, 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 this is really good and it's, you know, it's something that we've been fighting in education as parents and as a society, as community, and we need to keep fighting for this. Well, There's, let me play devil's advocate and just yeah. say, uh, is it the responsibility of government to censor uh, materials? In other words, is it the parents' responsibility to supervise their children's activities at public libraries and pub public places, or is it government's responsibility? I'm glad you brought that up, Orlando, because that was one of the topics that came across my mind was as a parent of, of two children who are under 10, it is my sole responsibility as um, as it relates to raising my children. I know the maturity level of my children and I know that that, hey, you know, when my child is ready to have the birds and the bees talk, you know, uh, when when is my child ready to have these controversial uh, type of conversations that are going to come up. Um, and so ultimately, as a parent, I feel that it's not the government's uh, position to tell me how to parent uh, my children. Now, do I think it is, um, do I think that it is appropriate for books that label such items in the children's section to be readily available? Um, I believe that you know, first of all, show me examples of these books. And maybe these books need to be kind of rated like a PG, like a PG rating, like a color code of some sort, put on the top shelf so, or, yeah. so that, you know, children can't just get them or mm -hmm. off in another parent resource um, location. Because some parents, you know, would like to utilize those books to be able to, to help them um, explain you know, a certain topics. And, you know, one of the ma other main topics was not just, you know, and I like to say the birds and the bees because that's, you know, something that comes up young at a younger age nowadays than it did whenever we were growing up. But um, topics such as, you know, that some parents want to address such as transgender, LGBTQ community and things of that sort. Um, some of those books are, are good resources in being able to, being able to address those topics for parents. Um, but should they be readily available for your five-year-old to run around and grab it? No. I'm reminded of a Supreme Court case many years ago. I think it was out of California and where a gentleman was wearing a T-shirt or a jacket that had uh, an expletive. And uh, 
filed a complaint. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, you know, government, uh, first of all, that's protected speech. Uh, while it may not appeal to certain people and certainly to children, it's not government's responsibility to curtail speech. And there are a lot of things in society that children will be exposed to. And government can't be the parent and protect and limit speech for the protection of young children that may see this. So it's an interesting case. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree that, you know, um, when I was a city councilman in Houston, I'm reminded in the 1990s, uh, there were a series of computers in a very public area of the, of the library. And there were, there were people that were accessing pornography and it became a big issue because the children were walking around and could actually see the screen. So, but there were measures that were taken uh, by dulling the screens. In other words, you couldn't see it at an angle and moving them certain areas. Uh, I agree, moving the books to a higher shelf, getting them out of a children's section, but an all out ban by government on, you know, what otherwise would be free speech is very dangerous. While it's very appealing, uh, you know, to have, have the government as a co-parent to some people, uh, I think it's the responsibility of uh, of the parents and not government. You know, I mean, I'm wondering, I mean, would the Scarlet Letter be a banned book? Right, right. Orlando. And that was one of the pr problems that some people had were, you know, that the actual uh, proposal had very um, vague listings on there and didn't say, hey, look, you know, a little bit more detail maybe, or maybe kind of changing up the process to to being able to, you know, to adhere to some of those other books that we read, you know, growing up, you know, Scarlet Letter or, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird, things of that sort. Now, I will say that the uh, while I was there, the other, um, the other, uh there was there were other people that were going up there and they were reading you know uh pieces of certain books that seemed like they were out worse than a romance novel but these and these books were supposed to be in the section for um in the teen section and it was alarming what was being what was being read out of those books that were placed in the teen section and it was actually kind of hard to hear but when I spoke with somebody on the library board, you know, and asking why or what, what's the reasoning for these being in the teen section, I got a really good answer that I wanted to share, which is, um, you know, she shared a story and said, look, she said, I was sexually assaulted as a young girl in my church camp, um, in my church camp growing up. She said, and I didn't want to say anything because, you know, I was brought up that I would be tainted if something happened. She said, additionally, I was repeatedly sexually assaulted growing up at a friend's house. Um, so what she said was she was ashamed to share that with her parents. But one thing that her parents did was they took her to the library each week. And when they took her to the library, she was able to find uh, material that addressed those things and was able to heal and move forward. And now, you know, she has a family and, and has a, and has, and is married and, and, you know, she's a, a school teacher. And so those, that kind of put another perspective on it. Yeah. Well, Larissa, All right, well, I know like we, you have we have your, your, your dog is, 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 <laughs> is, is crying. <laughs> he, he wants to go out. So Larissa, thank you so much. And uh, we we'll let you go and taking care of, of, of the, even the dog is right, crying yeah. because she didn't win. Right. Yeah. He's a little upset. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little upset there. It's upset. Larissa, thank you so much for your time. And of course, we're going to keep you in the loop on TLC for 2023. And we're going to support you in your uh, future plans uh, in uh, political, any race that you decide to to be. Thank you very much. Thank you for t to TLC, to Orlando, and everybody who has been so supportive throughout this race. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. And um, so everybody be, better be prepared to see my face and everybody else's face. Very good. Adelante. <laughs> awesome. Gracias, Larissa. Thank yeah, you thank so you, much. Larissa. And thank education, you. it's Gracias. one of the main topics also 
uh, for the tw the Texas Legislature 2023. That That's is started right. is going to start in January uh, 10. Uh, also, along with immigration and and a budget and other important topics that is going to be discussing in Texas Legislature 2023. And now the Republican Party has control of the both uh, chambers. So uh, we are our next guest is uh, Dr. Kevin Stewart. He is a political uh, science professor for uh, University of St. Thomas, and he's also a friend of TLC. He's been mm -hmm. also in our show before. And today we'll have him uh, talking about the legislature 2023 here in Texas and with uh, when the new um, uh, members of the uh, Congress in Texas because we have new candidates that they were running for uh, for office and now we have more Latinos, mm -hmm. more representation. So welcome to TLC, Dr. Stewart. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. So uh, tell us about the, the, the new uh, legislature that is coming on the 2023, what is going to be the issues and with the new positions that is taking in place, also with the Republican Party has control of both chambers. Right. Well, that's right. I think opportunities are now uh, increased for the Republican Party because they've got, um, they've got serious control of both both houses of the legislature, but that also means expectations are higher mm -hmm. um, because the, the people who helped get these representatives and senators elected are now going to expect results. You've got a Republican House, you've got a, you know, a, a Republican uh, majority, a sort of filibuster proof, so to speak, uh, Republican majority in the Senate, uh, Republican governor. So people are going, the expectations are now going to be very high on the issues that are front and center for uh, for the people of the state of Texas. So how do you One see that uh, playing out, Dr. Um, Dr. Stewart? Because, you know, we, we have these majorities, but a lot of times there's this attitude to play nice. And, you know, the Republican Party of Texas on their legislative priorities uh, as a county chairman, you know, I'm, I'm already getting the emails and, and hearing uh, from people that, that, you know, really, like you said, the expectations this time around are a lot higher to, for example, not have Democrat chairs and, and address election integrity and things like that. How, do, how much progress do you think will be made on some of these items that are, are being driven by the party as far as legislative priorities? An interesting telltale fight is going on right now about the issue that you mentioned, whether mm -hmm. the traditional practice of the legislature, which is that there are committee chairs um, given to or offered to the, the opposition party, um, whether that continues. I myself testified multiple times in front of um, committees in the legislature in the last session, and it makes an enormous difference who the committee chairman is mm -hmm. um, because they decide what issues, what bills move, what issues come before uh, the committee, how things are going to work. So if you want to know the answer to the question, why so little has been done, for example, on parental choice in education in the past, a big part of the answer is that Republican speakers of the House have been appointing Democratic chairmen for the education committee. Right, right. And I mean, the issue see facing the uh, state legislature, of course, is property taxes. There have been a lot of promises by Republicans to corrupt property taxes. And there's that debate by counties, 254 counties across the state, say that the legislature continues to shift the burden, the financial responsibility to local governments. Yet, you know, the state isn't doing what it needs to do in terms of funding let's say public education, which as we know is supported by property taxes, uh, infrastructure in counties, law enforcement, expansion of the criminal justice system, because we know there's a crime wave occurring in especially urban areas. So that costs more money, but the state is sort of saying, that's your responsibility. But now at the same time that you're supposed to deliver more services, you've got to cut property taxes. So where's that going to go? Where's that fight going? Yeah, so far the uh, fiscal projections are for huge surpluses mm -hmm. in the state budget. So I expect to see a pretty significant move. And in fact, the, the you know um, Dan Patrick has signaled that one of his top priorities is property tax relief. So I um, I expect we will see uh, multiple bills on that front, and it'll be a high priority issue uh, in the in the session. 
Right. But how do you uh, see that, Dr. Stewart? Do you see property tax cuts or do you see property tax caps? In other words, you know, the counties, the, the Texas Association of Counties and other interest groups will be fighting that. How do you see the, the that legislation coming to fruition? Yeah, I think that I suspect there will be a property tax cut, whether there's whether there's a cap, you know, an ongoing uh, long term rule change um, uh, that would cap things uh, is is, I think, up in the air. Uh, and, uh, and on that note, too, as well, uh, you know, what became a driving issue during the campaign for Governor Abbott was to take half the surplus and put it toward property tax relief. I bet I believe it was twenty seven billion dollars uh, surplus or around that area. And then all of a sudden, you know, at least you echoed what um, Lieutenant Governor Patrick has said as far as a priority. But we see kind of a, a fading away from that a little bit on the House side. Uh, how, do, how does that play out as far as using the surplus toward that relief? The House is always where the questions are. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's funny when you look to Washington, D.C., the questions are always with the Senate uh, mm -hmm. because the Senate tends to be a little uh, a little more independent and freewheeling in the way that they handle their own politics. And in Texas, it's, it's fascinating that it's actually the reverse uh, in that the Senate is more predictable and the House more more tumultuous and more up for grabs. So I think it is. It is a real question that's uh, where there's a lot of movement going on behind the scenes now, and things will be much clearer, say, 60 days from now than they are right now. I, but I do think fairly early in the session, we'll get a sense of where things are going. Interesting. Interesting. Anything else stand out that you think it will be a legislative priority? But I think the big, one of the biggest issues also is immigration. Yep. So we want you to talk about that because with the with the border crisis that we've been seeing and and in the border of Texas, it's it's crazy. So I think that's going to be another priority that is going to that we're going to see next year. I think that's absolutely right. With very little cooperation in Washington D.C., the state of Texas and other states that are border states are having to take more and more responsibility on themselves for addressing what can only be described accurately as a crisis at the border. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I expect to see legislation there. Uh, on on that issue. An, another issue that we might talk about that you mentioned um, or that, that might be worth mentioning is the grid. So uh, Texas, we are proud of being Texans and our independence. We have our own power grid, but that also means we have responsibility for our own power grid. And in the in the continuing wake of uh, winter storm Uri from 2021, mm -hmm. I expect to see legislation regarding uh, power infrastructure and the grid. Well, you know, that's interesting you mentioned that, but our grid is in fantastic shape. It's not a matter of the grid. You know, what happened a couple of years ago was a, a failure of, of, of uh, power generation that has nothing to do with the grid. The grid basically is, you know, you produce the power, send it to us, we'll distribute it. And the grid worked fine. There was no failure of the grid. Uh, what we had a failure of was the generation either by virtue of the fact that natural gas pipelines were frozen, the wind turbines were frozen, uh, that has nothing to do with the grid. So uh, I'm wondering, you know, what specifically do you see coming down the pike to address power generation, particularly when capacity and demand is really, capacity is low, demand is high. This happens in summertime where you have the rolling brownouts, sometimes blackouts, but you have uh, air, uh, times of the day where it's peak consumption and the state asks you to curtail your usage or in the winter time. So what specific legislation do you see coming? Yeah, I think that's right. So I would expect to see, given I think you accurately describe it, given the need for more generation and more capacity, I would expect to see some moves, especially because it contrasts politically so nicely with what's coming out of Washington. I would expect to see some moves to increase Texas's own energy independence by way of additional production and capacity. Yeah, that's very interesting. I want to go back to the issue of immigration because yeah. yep. I was going to you know, say that. that yeah, and, uh, we want to go back to immigration because I wanted you uh, put us in a perspective for our viewers because when we talk about immigration laws, we know that it's coming from the federal government. But what is in our power as a state? to put in place some um, uh, law on re or regulations on the, on the border crisis that we're having right now and the immigration issues in the border. 
some of that is, um, I won't say up for grabs, but being negotiated in the courts, right? Some mm -hmm. of it's being fought as to as far as exactly what um, what we are able to do, uh, because we do have a crisis, and it's a crisis both for the state and the federal government, in that we have an average of about eight thousand new people per day, every day. And we saw, I think, with uh, moves from both Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis to um, to to relocate some of those some of those immigrants, and that even a mild influx in in cities uh, up north created significant problems. Well, welcome to our world. We're talking right. about eight thousand per day. Yeah, no, yeah, I agree. And and but the sad thing is, uh, first of all, Dr. Stewart. This is not a new problem uh, for the state of Texas. Uh, we have been absorbing the cost of illegal immigration disproportionately compared to every other state simply because of the vastness of the distance of our border. I mean, they can come across it. Uh, Brownsville, you can come across it. Demick County, Maverick County, Valverde County. You know, you can cross across the big bend if you want to risk your life. But it's a massive uh, 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 border. And for years, uh, we, we have been absorbing those, those costs. I can tell you, when I served in public office as the Harris County Treasurer, we were spending millions of dollars of property taxes providing health care in terms of emergency visits by undocumented aliens. Mm -hmm. First of all, there's a federal law called EMTALA that says when someone presents themselves in the emergency room, regardless of legal status, you've got to treat them. You've got to stabilize them. Uh, the taxpayers don't have a choice in this. And the government, the federal government, which creates this problem, doesn't reimburse Texas taxpayers. And that's unfair. Uh, number two, we have a substantial amount of resources being spent on the border right now, you see with this surge, uh, and, and that's paid for by property taxpayers in Texas, law enforcement, the local sheriff, whether it's you know the Department of Public Safety, all that is absorbed again by the taxpayers of Texas. Federal government doesn't help us. So, but we're limited because you're correct. The federal government says that, you know, and Andrea says, well, what kind of laws and policies can we, we can't. I mean, the courts are very clear on that. This is the purview of the federal government. And so, you know, where does this end? I mean, I've said that often that the federal government is a co-conspirator in the importation of cheap labor in this country. And until we wrap our arms around that, we're going to continue with this problem and Texas is going to continue to pay out the wazoo. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely right. I mean, this is a, a problem where, you know, the Homeland Security, I mean, Mayorkas, uh, Secretary of uh, DHS, says the border is secure as 8,000 come across every single day to over 2 million each year. So so outside the legislative side, um, you know, we do have this through the Constitution where states can defend themselves, they can declare invasion. And, and is there anything that you see happening this legislative session, not necessarily through legislation, but just the, the fact that people are gathered in Austin, there's pressure on people to get something done that will actually do more than, quote, deport people to the border and actually start getting some relief for all these border communities. I think it's part of a broader trend that you see mm -hmm. of the sharp divides in the country pushing states to uh, have more robust federalism where they begin to push on the federal government, whereas in previous decades, they would have simply thrown their hands up. I think we should watch closely the issue because there may be some things, I'm sure that people are researching exactly what might be possible and exactly how far they might be able to go right now. I think we should expect to see some significant or, or and assertive moves by the state to, to force uh, to force the federal government to take more responsibility here, because as Orlando said, they they keep foisting costs on the state um, with their preferred policy. Right. Yeah, no, it's interesting because you know we ship uh, migrants up to Martha's Vineyard and up to Massachusetts <laughs> and up to uh, Cook County, Illinois, and areas that may need additional labor, and of course into New York 
And the first thing that happens is the local mayor says, well, well we can't absorb these 400 people you ch- you sent up, you know, people. and it's right. amazing to me how quickly they dispatch those people out of their communities. Take Martha's Vineyard, for example, the immigrants didn't last more than 72 hours before they were shipped away. And so that's the kind of response we want in Texas is that when the is this illegal invasion occurs that the federal government steps in and removes them as quickly as they did in Martha's Vineyard that's not happening and so you know it's going to be a tough issue uh Dr Stewart I wanted you to talk also now um about the the new positions that is being filled in the in the in both chambers you know in terms that now we have John Luhan now we have Mano de Ayala there are two Latinos, and it's a Latino representation, but also on the conservative side. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, and that may um, shake loose some of the issues that have been frozen in the sense that it is now clear that some of these conservative priorities are not limited to one racial or ethnic group, but are actually a multiracial, part of a multiracial coalition. Um, and, and given Texas's own, uh, racial and ethnic diversity, that may actually start to move some things. When you see these, uh, I think Hispanic conservatives are going to be an enormously important force in this session and and going forward. So how do you see the the landscaping for the the future elections um, here in Texas? I think the trends that we have seen uh, already start will, will actually increase or even accelerate uh, where as the as the Democrat as these as nationally the Democratic Party goes more and more toward identity politics issues that don't resonate particularly with Hispanic communities, we are likely to see more and more Hispanics, particularly working class Hispanics, mm-hmm. migrate to the Republican Party. Yeah, I absolutely Let's agree. Let's turn mean, over to education. Yeah. I have a quick question. Um, You know, for years, we've talked about vouchers. We've talked about school choice for parents. We've talked about charter schools. We've talked about all kinds of things to try to improve the quality of education and give parents a broader choice other than a government school, correct? I mean, it's like higher ed. You have private universities like the University of St. Thomas. You have public schools like the University of Houston, TSU, Houston Community College. At least when we are graduate from high school, we have choices in our education. It doesn't seem that way in terms of primary and secondary education. I've often argued that one of the most powerful lobbies in Austin is, of course, the Superintendents Association. Uh, They have a real grip on their local uh, elected state representative and maybe senator. Uh, Do you see any significant uh, public education policies being moved along in the legislative session this year? There's going to be a, a, a big push for more parental choice. There will be a variety of educa- of uh, legislative attempts there, legislative versions of this, everything from a, a full-on vouchers for everyone program to more targeted and tailored programs. I can say that as things have developed in other states in the past, the typical pathway is to start with Uh, a more tailored and targeted program for low income families, for families switching out of uh, public schools that are failing and giving them options first. And then the programs often grow from there. Whether Texas can go for the brass ring and get it all at once, I think is a really interesting question uh, for this session. But the reason that other states often start with those those more targeted and tailored programs is be- precisely because it blunts a lot of the criticisms that those superintendents uh, make. Well, Dr. Stewart, um, thank you so much. Yeah. I like to always say the call to action. Um, what we can tell our viewers besides that it's important to go and vote and, <laughs> and educate themselves. Um, because, you know, I, the end of the day this is like there there is is daily basis and our journey and our family and our work that is being affected and impact of any decision that the politicians are making um so tell us what we can tell uh, our viewers 
Yeah, I'd say one of the biggest things to understand is that state representatives and state senators are actually very responsive to constituent concerns and con uh, constituent input. So it is, don't be cynical. It is definitely worth your time and trouble to, to learn about the issues and then call your state rep, write to your state rep, call your state senator, write to your state senator. You will be surprised at the impact you can make. And I always say they yeah. work for us. We don't work for them. That's right. Yeah, that's <laughs> absolutely right. Well, Dr. Seward, thank you so much for your time and uh, for the information that you gave us today. And uh, happy thank holidays. Thank you. Great to be here. Yeah, thank Merry you, Dr. Christmas. Stewart. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Well, Orlando, you know, um, this is a very um, good example. You know, mm -hmm. what we're saying that when Dr. Stewart was saying that now we have a better re representation in the Latinos and conservatives. Now we see uh, the both chambers being in control of the Republican Party. And he was saying that, you know, we're seeing more uh, diversity in the representation in the Texas um, uh, when it comes to the legislator the legislators. So uh, that's why I, I want to bring uh, the Leadership Latino, our program that we help and teach the community or anybody that wants to run for office or want to be a leader in the community because that's our future. And that's what we want to encourage them to run for office and to have uh, to be the voice for their community. So uh, I wanted you to talk about uh, uh, or, or echo what uh, Dr. Stewart was saying. Well, you know, our government, <clears throat> a representative form of government, very unique in the world, uh, it requires uh, an informed citizenry and a, and a citizenry that's willing to get involved. Um, it's absolutely essential. One of the interesting things that's going on that I'm fascinated with right now is, as you may know, LULAC, the League of United Latin American Citizens, has filed a lawsuit against the city of Houston because of its lack of representation by a certain ethnic group, uh, specifically Hispanics. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's really interesting to me that dynamic and what's going on. Um, so at Texas Latino Conservatives, of course, we, through our nonprofit, Leadership Latino, uh, we educate, we motivate, we encourage people to participate in the political process. You don't have to be Hispanic. Uh, you don't have to be Republican. Anyone uh, can join our effort and, uh, and, 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 and enjoy the benefits of the seminars that we provide based on the skill of our presenters, uh, the, the, the knowledge they've acquired over the years. Uh, Bobby is one of our presenters. He talks to our students about the media. Obviously, you know, I've been in public life for many years. Andrea, you've been in the media. We have a lot of experts, uh, social media experts. So we provide our students, anyone that's interested in getting involved in the political process, sort of a, uh, a very compact, short compendium of what the political world is. So um, I'm, I'm excited that, you know, like Larissa, uh, we don't always win. Uh, our candidates don't always win, but they get involved. They, they, they establish roots in their communities. They get a message out. Uh, that's what we want to do. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see what happens with this LULAC lawsuit because I don't think you can compel government to compel people to go vote and participate politically. This is going to be very interesting. And another thing I want to say about this lawsuit is in the city of Houston, for example, if uh, you are uh, a taxpayer, you get five at-large members, the city council, and your uh, district council member as representative. So theoretically, you have seven members of the city council that represent you. If we go back to a single member district situation, you only have one district representative and the mayor that you could influence. Everyone else works for other people in the district. So it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. So yeah. saying that, I want to um, tell everybody that we're having Leadership Latino class at the end of January 2023. And next week on Wednesday, we're going to dedicate the entire show, the entire program TLC Live to talk about Leadership Latino. We're going to have Gina, who is the head of that or um, mm -hmm. of that part of the program uh, in TLC. And we're going to have two former 
uh, classmates that they're after um, taking the class of uh, Leadership Latino, now they are involved. They're not running for office, but they are involved. And when you were saying, um, Orlando, that we, we don't always have winners, uh, but they get involved. To me, they're being, yep. you know, winners yep. because they're getting involved in the and, and eventually, you know, they bring learning and they eventually decide to run. So that's the whole purpose of Leadership Latino and Texas Latino Conservatives. And Bobby, I, I wanted you to talk about the program because you get involved with us. First, we invite you as right. a guest <laughs> yes. at TLC Life. And after that, you get involved with us and uh, Leadership Latino. And now you're filling up. I mean, you've been growing with <laughs> us uh, in Texas Latino Conservatives. I know. it's It's been so fun. I mean, as far as just showing up one time and then, you know, I attended uh, Leadership Latino and uh, I just had a wonderful time with it. And now I help, you know, do the media training and, and dealing with the press and, and things like that. But it's a, it's a great opportunity to be involved. And I invite people to to check out Texas Latino Conservatives. I mean, this this Leadership Latino, this next one is right here in Houston. You can find out about it at TexasLatinoConservatives.com. But um but the people that come out of that, it's like Maya Flores and mm -hmm. other people running for office and winning elections and and being that voice, as Larissa said, the, that conservative voice of a new generation. And and we see the the Hispanics, the, the influence of conservative Hispanics across the country and especially in Texas. And Texas Latino conservatives is the, the, the beacon of that. Yeah. And, and I'm so happy to be involved and I'm looking forward to January. Yeah. So Orlando, we're looking for uh, to see you back here in Houston. Uh, you're coming back um, close to Christmas, but next week uh, it's going to be December 14. It's going to be our last show of 2022 before we uh, go on the holidays break. And Bobby is going to also be with us here at the studio. You're going to be in Montana, but after that, uh, we're happy to see you back here in Houston, and we have uh, to put together all the plans that we have in Texas Latino Conservatives for 2023. So stay tuned with us. Go check our website, TexasLatinoConservatives.com. Check our Leadership Latino, which is inside also the program in, uh, under TLC, but also we have LeadershipLatino.com. So you can either go to a, a one of the pages and uh, get involved, uh, become a member of Texas Latino Conservatives. It's only $35 a year. It's nothing, but it just, you know, those contributions help us to have, uh, to deliver our mission and our vision. So, Orlando, uh, I'm glad that you're having a better weather over there in Montana, and we're looking forward to see you back in Houston. Diane, I want to thank Bobby for filling in. You do a wonderful job, Bobby, and, uh, you know, your paycheck's in the mail. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. For, uh, to, to, buy, to buy Christmas gifts for us. That's right. Yeah, exactly. It just goes back Okay, to Orlando, it. thank you. And thank you, everybody, for um, always be with us in TLC Live every Wednesday. Nos vemos el próximo miércoles. See you guys next Wednesday. Bye-bye.